This episode of Story Comic Presents is sponsored by JanusPointPress.com. Watch out for wormholes. Welcome to Story Comic Presents, where we interview amazing storytellers and artists. This is episode 324. I'm your host, Barney Smith of StoryComic.com, and we're honored to have with us the internationally celebrated and legendary award-winning author, <laughs> Catherine Patterson. Catherine. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So one of the things I wanted to, you know, first kind of talk to you about as well is that you are a prolific author in a lot of um, not only children's books, but young, young adult books and also some historical fiction. What, what would you say is that um, somebody was first um, came to you and said, I got a five year old child and I want to start them off on a Catherine Patterson book. What would be that first book that you would say that definitely, you know, give your child who's five this book that I wrote? Well, unfortunately, even though I have done several picture story books, right, uh, they go out of print very fast. Oh, uh, okay. Um, there's something about um, a, a picture books that mm. they're sort of like lettuce, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that they, very few of them stay in print very long because they got to make way on the shelves for next year's crop of picture books. And, you know, for example, um, the um, Blueberries for the Queen, which is a book that I really love. And my husband and I did it together uh, because um, it's really his story. When he was a mm. child, uh, he picked blueberries and gave them to the Queen of the Netherlands, who was in exile during World War II. And he, they were saying that uh, his family was visiting his cousin, and it was the town where the Queen had, had uh, gotten Franklin Roosevelt to get him a place in Massachusetts to spend the summer. <laughs> and so um, he had knew that she was going to be in the same town that they were going to be visiting, and they grew a lot of blueberries. So he picked a horde of blueberries to take to the queen. And his cousin just snorted. She said, he said, you know, they've got guards all over the place. You'll never get to see the queen. And uh, he, not daunted, he went and he, got to the first guard and he said he had these blueberries for the queen. And so the, the uh, guard called the kitchen and said, well, I do, this little boy has brought blueberries and he wants to give them to the queen. And the cook or whoever answered said, well, send him up to the kitchen and we'll make sure that he gets, them, we get them to the queen. So he goes to the kitchen and, uh, the queen's daughter, who was her, her the crown princess, was in the kitchen. And uh, she heard the little boy said, Jordan, she said, would you like to give them to the queen yourself? And he said, <laughs> you know, that was his original intent, of course, as a nine-year-old. And uh, so he said, of course. And so he was taken into the room where the queen was, and he gave them to the queen. And uh, she was very polite and and can very graciously. And he ran back to his cousin's house gleefully. And the cousin was furious that he hadn't gone too. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so we were just telling the story to um, friends of ours because we were visiting that particular town uh, and uh, tell, and so John told them this story and they, he, she was worked in publishing, children's publishing and he ran a children's bookstore and they said, well, 
and I think you written that story. And we looked at each other and we thought, well, I haven't rewritten that story. So <laughs> this, this is a fictionalized account of the story. Now, I, it makes me heartbroken that this book is out of print. And I'm always, because it's such a wonderful book to give to um, when you have a new baby, because they can grow up with the beautiful illustrations and the story. And I got a dick, had the tickets of time trying to buy a copy off the internet, but that's what happens to paper, to uh, uh, picture books. And so when you ask me what book I would recommend for a five-year-old, I would definitely recommend this one, but <laughs> good luck getting it, is what I'm saying. And if it's, if it's a girl, I would definitely recommend uh, uh, the King's Equal in its illustrated form. But there again, uh, it's out of print. They have a sort of a lousy little paperback chapter book version of it with illustrations which were not even true to the story. Uh, oh, wow. But And I'm not going to recommend you by that, but good luck finding this one <laughs> on the internet. As an author, how much sway or how much how much say do you have in the illustrators who work on your books? Well, usually none. Uh, in the case of the King's Equal, uh, I've been in Russia, or it was the Soviet Union there, mm. and met Vladimir and uh, his. Uh, there was a. a an editor from Harper on the same trip. And she said, uh, why don't you and Foggin do a book together? You're enjoying each other's company so much. And I said, well, actually, Foggin does fairy tales. I mean, I had seen his illustrations. He was very famous in the Soviet Union as an illustrator. And I don't mm. write fairy, I don't write fairy tales. And she said, well, think about it. And I really didn't think about it. And then one morning I was in the shower and this whole fairy tale just sort of popped into my head. And I couldn't wait to throw in my bathrobe and go to my study. <laughs> and, and the book kind of wrote itself. It was the quickest writing I'd ever done. It was usually, a, you know, my novels take me from a year to three years to write. And yeah, I'd written one in the shower. But um, <laughs> I, I did do some editing uh, on it, but it's essentially the story that I wrote in the shower. And I love it. And it's wonderful book to give to young girls because it's about uh, the power of young women who won't give up. <laughs> right. Are you somebody that starts typing it out as it goes or you have notebooks or because you're still ready as of recently you just put out a, a book called birdie's bargain just a yeah. a couple years ago so you're still very much still writing well i, I thought i was going to retire <laughs> <laughs> i mean everybody was retiring or dying um uh, and uh i thought oh, well my editor did uh get sick and died and I had the same editor for 40 plus years. Wow. And my husband, who was my main support, died. And I thought, well, the two people that have really made me the writer that I am uh, are dead. So mm. I, I should quit. And I, I had often told Virginia Buckley, my editor, that when she retired, I'd have to retire because all all of my novels to that point had been written with her help. And uh, then I, w I took a trip to Cuba and um, I was so excited about the literacy effort in Cuba that turned Cuba in one year into a literate, totally literate country. Uh, and when I came back, I was, you know, just full of it. and. Uh, one of my writer friends said, you should write that 
story. Uh, like, you know, nobody, I'm not Spanish. I don't even, if you're Hispanic, I don't even speak Spanish. But I, how could I do it? But then I, I talked to a wonderful editor, Karen Lotz, and she said, I said, I was thinking about, you know, a narrative about it with lots of photographs because there, there are many photographs in the Cuban literacy uh, campaign. And uh, she said, Catherine, I hear the excitement in your voice. I think it should be a novel. And so I began writing um, my brief this year about the young people who went out into the countryside and taught the peasants how to read and write. Mm. In one year, turned the country into a literate nation. And Cuba is still 99 something point, point something literate. America's, I think, 84% literate. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can see uh, we haven't done our job yet. And then um, I, I, I went to, uh, to uh, I'm a, on the board of trustees at the Vermont College of Fine Arts. And I took part in a summer uh, residency in England. And I, I was just going to be, you know, do some speaking and stuff with the group. But, and they were having workshops. And I, I told the, the instructors that I wouldn't go to the workshops because, you know, that was for, for people who had actually enrolled. In, and I said, no, no, come here, it'll be fun. And so uh, when I went to the workshop on how to write, a novel, I thought, well, I got to pretend I'm writing something. <laughs> and because that's what the workshop is all about. And uh, I've thought of an idea that I'd been playing around with for years and never been able to turn into a book. And then I realized that another idea that I had played around for, for years, if I put the two of those ideas together, I could write a book. And, and then I, I broke my leg and ankle on the ice. Thank you for much. And I uh, was really laid up, and, and my kids were helping take care of me. And so my son, who, older son, who didn't want me to stop working, bought me a table uh, that I could put my wheelchair underneath. And my younger son gave me a set of, of uh, barbells so I could uh, be strong enough to push the wheelchair. <laughs> and I wrote Bernie Sorry. <laughs> and, and so how do you know so so Catherine, how do you determine that a story is going to be a good children's book as compared to historical fiction or as compared to like a, a young adult book? How do you kind of make that determination of Oh I don't what really make that determination, Barney. I sort of yeah. um listen to, to the story. Right. And the story story tells me what it is. Uh, I mean, of course, something sparks the idea. Um, and um, I, I remember I, my first three novels was, were historical novels set in Japan. And I yeah. started them because you know, I, I, I lived in Japan for four years. And I thought, well, I'm writing. I was, I was taking an adult class on writing. And I was sort of writing short stories and things every week. And I thought, well, if I can write a story a week, they weren't selling. Uh, I could write a chapter a week. So I realized that my first novel has, I think, 14 chapters, and the year has 52 weeks. <laughs> but, but it did take me at least a year to write it. And, and I didn't know anybody. Uh, in publishing. I didn't have, I mean, nobody would have taken me on as an agent. Uh, and I, I uh, so I just went to the library and looked to see what books um, I admired in that would be sort of like, not, not novels, <laughs> young people said, 12th century right. fan, but uh, what, what author uh, what publishers whose books I admired and I just began mailing it out 
Mm -hmm. And uh, in those days, no more friends, I'm very sorry to say, but in those days, you could do that. Mm -hmm. you, could send, you could send a, a manuscript to a publisher, and there'd be some flunky, you know, usually a young woman just out of college who wanted to get into publishing, who would be assigned to read them. And of course, they wouldn't read every word of every book, but they'd read enough to figure out if they were worth taking to one of the real editors to read further. And that's, that's what happened in my first novel, um, Senator Jordan, who was just out of college, started reading it and took it to the senior editor who had just come back from a trip to Japan, loved Japan, and decided to publish my first novel. Wow. So I felt, I, you know, you can call it luck, I call it providence, but that's how I got started. Right. <laughs> And, and so when you would like earlier in your career as well, did you end up writing stories that you wanted to tell or did you end up writing stories that you wanted people to know about? Well, I started, you know, because I'm not one of these people that just has ideas blossoming all the time and you get to pick one. I, I finish a novel and I think, well, that was a good career while it lasted. And my, fam my family originally would get worried, and then they just started rolling their eyes. Because there's usually space between my novels. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have another novel ready to jump onto. And sometimes there's a long space between novels. Because, you know, you don't want to waste all those trees. You know, how many trees have to give up their lives for a modest, publishing effort. Too many, too many in most cases. And is it going to be worth all those trees, you have to ask yourself, or is it going to be worth this many years of my ever shortening life? And any idea I begin to take seriously has to pass those two tests. <laughs> and not many do. <laughs> uh, uh, and that's why, you know, I, I have a file where I have idea, failed ideas. And that's sometimes, as in the case of Bernie, they came to um, fruition, but they don't always do that. Watch out for wormholes, because a good book is a wormhole, whether it's paper or pixels. Explore our artist books and chat books, including the winning 2022 Chautauqua Janus Prize Lecture at JanusPointPress.com. And sign up for news of our upcoming sci-fi, sensual, and literary collection, Event Horizon. This short story collection on cosmic decisions and their impact is written by award-winning author Stephanie Nina Pizzarillos and features comics, prose, photography, an original canvas work by an array of exciting artists. Visit JanicePointPress.com. And do you say when it when it comes to some of your stories, some of them have you know, really strong characters. Other have really powerful locations. When you start writing a story, like an impetus of an idea, does it come from a location that you want to write about, or does it come from you have an idea of a person? that you want to tell their story? Well, each book is different, as you okay. can imagine. Yeah. Um, I, for example, Jacob of I Love, mm -hmm. the impetus for that was be, suddenly being aware of conversations in which a perfectly intelligent friend of mine would say something like, well, mother always loved him best. Or, well, if my sister hadn't done so-and-so when I was seven years old, my life would have been quite different. And I thought, do you really want to spend your whole life being crippled by childhood jealousies? <laughs> and I, I thought, um, you know, how sad. And, 
And then I thought, well, you know, because I'm biblically oriented, I thought, well, just think of all the stories of sibling rivalry in the Bible. I mean, it starts out, Cain kills Abel, right? Right. Yeah. And it just goes on from there. I thought, you know, we, we're all so Freudian. We think it's a, the, the bad relationship is between parent and child. But I think just as many fraught relationships are between siblings. And uh, so I decided I would write a story about twins. Of course, I've never been a twin. I don't really even have any good twin friends. Uh, but, uh, you know, Jacob and Esau were my inspiration, and they were twins. Uh, and, uh, but I fiddled around with it for quite a while because I didn't have, I didn't have a setting. Um, and you, you, you know, the setting is as important as character. Right. Uh, I, you know, whenever I hear a writer say, well, it could have been said anywhere, I get all worried about the worth of their work <laughs> because <laughs> a book has got to be set in a real, time in a real place, even if, if you've made up the world as you would in a fantasy. Uh, it, it's got to be, it got to get its feet on some earth, and it's right. got to, it's, it's got to uh, be set in a certain time. Mm -hmm. So, because I'm, you know, I write realistic fiction, really. It wasn't until at Christmas time, sometime later, um, my sister gave my older son a copy of, of um, Beautiful Swimmers, which had won the uh, Pulitzer, I think. Uh, it's a, the story of the crabbers and fisher folk mm -hmm. on, the, on the islands off of Maryland and Virginia. I thought, I'm going to set it on an island in the Chesapeake Bay because I want this Teenager, young teenager to feel isolated. And boy, if I put her on an island in Chesapeake Bay, she will really be isolated. I, you know, I began studying about the islands in the Chesapeake Bay, and they were converted to Methodism uh, by, you know, the Methodists used to have horseback riders that went everywhere to preach. Well, this and this was converted by one that took a boat <laughs> and converted um, the islands of the Chesapeake Bay. And, the, you know, the, one of the most difficult sentences in the Bible is the one uh, which says, Jacob, have I loved and Esau, have I hated? And I'd always felt this deep sympathy for Esau, who was the one not chosen. Um, and so I thought I'm going to write a book and have Esau as a central figure. I, there's this wonderful uh, sentence in the Midrash which says, Messiah will never come until the tears of Esau cease. Mm. And I thought, that, you know, until that healing occurs, um, there's no, no real ending, no real. So, uh, you know, people have criticized the ending of Jacob Bob, and I said, but you don't understand. You don't call a book Jacob. Have I loved until you come to the place where you love Jacob? Mm. Uh, mm. So my British publisher wanted me to eliminate the last chapter in which uh, Louise sees what happened when the day of their birth and comes to understand and love, of whom she's been jealous all her life. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, yes, I'm, when people say, which is your favorite book, uh, that's impossible to say. But if you ask me which book am I most proud of, 
It's Jacob of Old. Wow. Um, because it was so hard to write for many reasons. And yet I finally looked at it and said, I did it. I did what yeah. I set out to do. Uh, usually you finish a book and you think, did I do what I set out to do? In that case, I should, I don't think I'd overcome the things that were keeping me from writing that book. And of course, one of the things that was keeping me from writing the book was I thought it was inspired by other people. So why was I so angry every day when I went to the typewriter? <laughs> oh, see, you know, it's cheaper than psychotherapy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so at that point when the book was finished, how much, uh, how much hesitation did you have, you know, sharing that with your editor to say, when you first sent out that draft for your editor to look at? Oh my gosh. You, while I was writing, Jacob was shipping. It was one of the three year books. Mm. In the meantime, Master Puppeteer won the National Book Award. Bridge to Terabithia won the Newberry. Um, Gilly Hopkins won the National Book Award and was a on a book for the Newberry. Jacob that I love won the Newberry. Well, I mean, he did eventually, but those other books, and I thought, how can I send this book that I've struggled over and I'm not even sure if it's any good because it's going to be printed. Right. I mean, I should have had more respect for my editor. She wouldn't print something that was unworthy of her, <laughs> much less me. Uh, but I thought, I think I'll just send it a, a, with a fake name on it. And if she decides to publish it, then it'll be okay. You know, I'll tell her I wrote it. And uh, so she, because it had been so long since she'd heard from me, she asked me, um, are you working on anything? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, but I'm not sure if it's going to be any good. And she said, please don't send it to me anonymously. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that's exactly what I planned to do. <laughs> I'm not sure I ever confessed to her that, <laughs> that I had planned to send it to her in a plain brown rocker. Or <laughs> but, uh, 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 you know, when she read it, she really liked it. And I thought, well, okay. And then, you know, of course, there's always revision. And then, mm. and then when I finally finished revising, I thought, it's okay, you know. But I was astounded when it wasn't any very, just absolutely astounded. And uh, in fact, when they gave me the call that it won the Newberry, I said, you got to be kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the <laughs> chair of the committee who called me said, Catherine, I do not kid about it. <laughs> and it's you've been a huge proponent uh for for literacy as you mentioned too with birdie's bargain i mean you've been a part of the the national children's book and literacy alliance yeah for many years um where do you see today in this recording in 2023 where how do you feel like the success of of you know the children's literary foundation and the the National Children's Book and Literacy Alliance, and, and libraries in general, where do you see um, the successes and where do you see some of the challenges they're gonna be facing in the next few years? I see mostly challenges. Hmm. You know, states saying they'll arrest librarians for reading books on the banned list and send them to jail. I mean, this hasn't happened since Nazi Germany, has it? Right. Maybe yeah. in, in Soviet Russia. Uh, what is our country coming to where freedom of the press, freedom to read what you want to read is coming under attack by politicians and parents can go to libraries and demand that books be taken off the shelf so that uh, they, no, no other parent's child will have any access to them. I mean, come on, folks, what are you so afraid of? 
Mm. And uh, I, I, you may have seen them, the t-shirts and, and the tote bags with, uh, I'm with the band um, and a shelf of books where Grace Jarrett Griffith is sitting. And of course, that's out of date. Those are the books that were banned in the 70s and 80s. But, and I, I said, they said, are they banning you? And I said, no, I don't think they're paying any attention to me because I'm white uh, and um, straight. It's, <laughs> it's everybody who's of color or LGBTQ plus that is being attacked now. And it breaks my heart. I just can't understand how you can go after another human being the way people are going after other, each other. Mm -hmm. And that my country, which should be the freest, free land of liberty, mm -hmm. should be having to go through this. It just doesn't make any sense to me. They were mm -hmm. teaching people to hate people. Right. Instead of care mm -hmm. and respect and love our neighbors. What would be your advice to um, people that are wanting to get into maybe writing, being an author in these times? What would be your advice to them? Well, uh, one of my sons is a, a playwright and writes screenplays. And when he started, working in that area because he started out as an actor and then he started writing. And I said, well, David, if you want to be a writer, you need two things. You need talent. And I know you have talent. You need persistence. And without both of those, you're probably not going to get very far. But you don't know if you have talent until you persist. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, people, are frequently asking me to read something and see if it's any good. Well, that's not my job, you know. Um, I'm not an editor, I'm not an agent, I can't really help you. In fact, the, the one manuscript that somebody asked me to look at, which I, I uh, did, um, was uh, refused, you know, it's rejected. So my say so didn't do any good for this person. And so I said, I didn't really tell you, don't bother. And, and also, you know, there's kind of a legal problem with me reading an unpublished manuscript. Because if I ever wrote anything that looked anything like yours, and this has happened to me, go try to sue me. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, my on one book, my publisher's lawyers had to get involved and make me swear that I had never read this other person's book. That they were sure I'd stolen my idea from them. Sorry, friends. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you got to keep at it because, right. and, and you know, what I, the thing I hear most of all is, well, I know I have this great idea for a book. But I just don't have time to write it. And I thought, nobody has time to write it unless that's, you know, um, right. I, 15 minutes a day. I, I started writing seriously when I had four tiny children. And I wrote around the interruptions. And your subconscious is very helpful. Uh, and then, you know, I would think when I was washing dishes or changing diapers, I'd try to pay attention to the children. You know, I none of them died or got badly hurt. Um, but <laughs> um, then you take the five minutes of writing time that you're given and write down what yeah. you can. It's a sloppy way, but sometimes it's the only way. Right. And, and um, if, you, if you really want to write, you'll find a way. So, so Catherine, if people want to kind of learn, learn more about you, uh, the library of books that you've created and, and written, 
um, and learn more about you, where's where's the best place they could go to? Well, I wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always swore I'd never write a memoir. And uh, uh, I was persuaded. Well, I, I started doing it because I realized I, my husband was sick for many years and I was much a caretaker. And then I, I thought, well, you know, I mean, I started, I remember a, an old family story and I, I started to tell it to one of my children. I said, well, of course I told you about it. And they said, no. And I realized that the stories I heard from my mother were when we were washing dishes together. And huh. most of my children's lifetime, they had a dishwasher. So the many stories were going to be excuse me lost if i didn't write them down and i began writing down family stories and eventually um after my husband died we put them in a memoir which is called stories of my life very very imaginative title of course i wanted to call it kitchen sink stories but <laughs> they didn't think <laughs> that would be jazzy enough. So they gave the jazzy title of stories in my life <laughs> to it. Uh, and uh, it was published by, went out of print faster than it took me to write it. And then uh, my denominational publisher, Westminster, John Knox Press, uh, put out an updated version to prove that I was still alive. And, somewhat edited version so that's the version yeah. that's available yeah. perfect and then and, and, and people can actually go also to katherinepatterson.com and there there's all of your books are listed there the stories of a lot of the books um, will be in stories of my life yeah perfect yeah well listen uh, Catherine, thank you so much for coming on it's been a genuine pleasure um, talking to you about writing well, it's always fun to talk about yourself. And <laughs> so thank you for this opportunity. You're welcome. <laughs>